Production support for the weekly special is provided by Smithville, a local provider of fiber optic based internet, TV, and phone services. Smithville's quantum fiber optic network allows large amounts of data to travel around the world from local homes and businesses. More at smithville.net. IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. publichealth.indiana.edu. And WTIU members, thank you. Welcome to the weekly special. We're out of the studio and we're doing a tank trip to Fort Wayne. We're going to visit some local favorites, such as the Auburn Court Duesenberg Museum, the Botanical Conservatory, and the legendary Coney Island. And we're going to go inside a world-famous genealogy center, and we're going to hang out with the Fort Wayne Curling Club. It's all coming up tonight on the Weekly Special. Welcome to the Weekly Special. I'm Daryl Neer. And I'm Erica Sagan. You know, even if you think you know all there is to know about Fort Wayne, even if you're from Fort Wayne, I think we're still going to surprise some of you tonight. Now, this city is rich in history, and we're going to start off by looking at some basketball history as we take a look at the Fort Wayne Pistons. Don Graham may just be the world's biggest Pistons fan. I was uh, always a sports fan, always a nut for sports. You're probably picturing professional basketball right now, and you'd be correct. But if you're picturing Detroit, you're looking a little too far north. The Detroit Pistons actually began life in Fort Wayne, Indiana as the Zollner Pistons. The team was named after industrialist Fred Zollner, who, not surprisingly, made his fortune making Pistons. And it was the Zollner Pistons that thrilled Don as a kid. We had a four-model Philco radio in our living room. <clears throat> Nobody else in the family seemed to be all that interested, but I would listen to them on the radio whenever I could. And the Pistons had some legendary games, including one record-setting win against the Lakers. Back then, the Minneapolis Lakers was the, was the powerhouse of the league. So Fort Wayne figured there's one way, maybe we can beat them, and, and they stalled. In the final period, they were a point behind, 18 to 17. Larry Faust took an inbounds pass, took a 25-foot shot. He just banked it off the backboard and went in. Three seconds left. Pistons won 19 to 18. And it's gone down in history as the lowest scoring game ever, and still is today. For years, the team played at Fort Wayne's Northside High School Gym, which only held about 3,000 people. It was so compact. The, the stands and the, and the fans were setting almost down on the floor. Not that that was a bad thing. When you got to the Coliseum, it was just kind of wide open, and you're sitting way back, and took something away from it, I don't know. That was built mostly because of the Pistons and moved the Pistons into a bigger arena, draw bigger crowds. As it turned out, it didn't draw bigger crowds. And that's one of the reasons Fred moved the team to Detroit after the 1957 season. And after the move to Detroit, some Fort Wayne residents forgot about their NBA past, but not Don. So about 25 years ago, he began collecting all things Pistons. I don't know which was the first piece I bought. It might have been a program, but I got started. And it's like, once you get started, it's Katie by the door, because it, it's just not going to stop. I've done a lot of auctions. Been to a lot of antique shops looking for this stuff. Probably at least Three quarters of the stuff that ever existed is gone. It's unbelievable how much stuff gets pitched. But it's also amazing how much stuff is still out there. He's collected programs, ticket stubs, and lots of photos, all neatly organized in three ring binders. Eventually, word of Don's collection made it to the folks at the Allen County Library. So now, every Tuesday and Friday, Don sits at his computer, scanning and cataloging, preserving history, and developing a fan base of his own. 
Don's my idol. I mean, Don is, is lucky enough to have had a, a lifetime hobby that he's been able to do even more with after he retired. It's gonna be a tremendous gift to the community what he's doing and he loves it. I mean, he just absolutely loves it. Soon, Don's gift will be available for all to enjoy, both electronically and in beautiful hardbound volumes that will be stored at the library. But for Don Graham, it's simply his hobby and a true labor of love. I don't have a clue what I've got wrapped up in it. And it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's none of it's for sale. It belongs in Fort Wayne. It's part of Fort Wayne's history, sports history. So it belongs in Fort Wayne. Eric, it was really interesting to hear the origin stories of the National Basketball League and the Fort Wayne Pistons. Yep, and another undeniable part of this city's history is right here. It's Fort Wayne's famous Coney Island. It's my first time here, and I'm excited to go inside and see what's cooking. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Erica. Thanks so much for nice having us here you. today. Hi, Daryl. Welcome to the Coney Island. Wow, stepping in here is a little bit like stepping back in time. It's incredible. It actually is. So Fort Wayne's famous Coney Island has been around for 100 years this September, and it's been in your family for 98 years. What makes your Coney dog so famous? Well, it's a great product. My grandfather was an immigrant, and, you know, he didn't have the education, the business degree but he had the sense of welcoming and hospitality and he loved to cook so having high standards in the food he prepared was very important and it just continues that way this is what the Coney Island is about we cook fresh every day it's a three-hour process we don't mess with perfection <laughs> it worked a hundred years ago and it's working it now. now so <laughs> That's our Coneana, and we steam our buns, and, and that's a really nice touch to it. Yeah, with your our customers, customers really expect it, right? Absolutely. <laughs> they want it to be the way they remembered, whether they're 85 years old or five years old. <laughs> Did you know that hot dogs were going to be your future <laughs> growing well, up? Well, I always used to joke, I come from a long line of weenies. So <laughs> we knew having it continue on was important. I kind of had to fight my way in. My, Did my you really? father. <laughs> He just didn't see his daughter working in the Coney Island. The only reason he gave me a chance, and he said it was because he thought I'd hate it. And he said, she loves it. She loves it. And it's about our customers. And it's like a party at my house every day. It's a great thing because it's about family. Not only is the Coney Island our family, but it's a part of other people's family, too. The great thing is when people say it's the good old days, remember the good old days. But with the Coney Island, each generation at the same time can remember the good old days sure. because they're sharing it now. They have one common good old day, and it's this day. You know what else I bet Island. has not changed is the amazing smell in here. It's so delicious. So I think that it's come time for Daryl and I to try well, a I famous you Coney too. dog. All right, let's go. <laughs> Daryl, these are hitting the spot. Have you ever had one of these before? I grew up on these, and they're just as great as I remember them. Yeah, it's my first one, and it's awesome. <laughs> and so as we finish up these legendary Coney Island dogs, we're going to send you up north to Auburn Court Duesenberg Museum to check out some legendary cars that were probably parked right out on the streets of Fort Wayne. Cheers. Cheers. Over 100 million gears are spinning over the roads in the transmissions of our automobiles. The engine on this model is running at a constant speed of 90 revolutions a minute. The history of the Auburn Automobile Company started with the Eckhart family, who founded the carriage building business here in the town of Auburn in 1874. The carriage company was somewhat successful, and around about the turn of the 20th century, they became aware of a new invention, the horseless carriage, that might have a great impact on their business. So they took a look at the manufacture of the Auburn automobile, which they came up with in 1903. They achieved a fair amount of success with the car, enough to encourage the company to build a plant dedicated solely to the production of the automobile. The company had a tremendous impact on Northeast Indiana. At one time, the company employed over a thousand people in this area. 
smaller companies sprouted up around the bigger company to supply parts and services. Before World War I, there were 10 other automobile companies in this town that produced cars as well. So uh, this area was uh, becoming known as Little Detroit for a while, just because of its uh, automobile manufacturing centers. With the passing of Mr. Eckert in 1915, and the country on the verge of an economic recession following World War I, cars simply stopped selling. Desperate to keep the company alive, investors turned to renowned car enthusiast E.L. Cord. Cord made a unique offer. He'd work for the company with no pay, as long as he had the ability to buy stocks and could take a percent of the profits. In the summer of 1924, Cord started at Auburn. By November of 1925, he owned it. Once E.L. Cord took over, the sales of Auburn automobiles just grew exponentially, and he was quite successful. Successful enough, he introduced another line of cars, the Cord Automobile, the first successful front-wheel drive car, and he also purchased the Floundering Duesenberg Company from Indianapolis and charged them with the challenge of building America's most grand and most luxurious automobile, the fabulous model J. Duesenberg. Though relatively small, the impact they had on the automobile industry was astounding. The company introduced many innovations still utilized today, including X-member frames, retractable headlights, four-wheel hydraulic brakes, and the ever-popular supercharged engines. Not only did they change the way cars were built in the U.S., they changed the car industry across the world, exporting to 99 different countries in its height. The Auburn Automobile Company reached its zenith in 1931 when they produced over 33,000 automobiles. This was enough to put Auburn at number 13 among all United States manufacturers, which was quite significant in those days when you consider there were about 50 manufacturers. E.L. Cord was once quoted as saying, a conquered challenge is no longer any fun. And he had felt as if he had come to the town of Auburn, taken an ailing company, turned it around, made it extremely successful, and now it was time for him to move on to other challenges. When he left the town of Auburn, the company was never the same. That year would be the last the company took a profit. By 1937, faced with the looming Great Depression, it was over. The doors closed on the Auburn Automobile Company and Duesenberg, where they remained closed until 1974. The Auburn Court Duesenberg Automobile Museum is the only automobile museum that is located in the original factory headquarters building. Sometimes we hear people say, even if this place didn't have cars in it, it would be interesting to come here just because of its structure. We have approximately 120 cars on exhibit. Some of the cars are one of a kind. They may be prototype or in some cases a recreation of famous show cars. Many of our cars have celebrity owners. Every one of them has a story behind them. The 20s and 30s are, are known as the golden age of the classic automobiles. Many of these cars are hand built, one of a kind, Unlike today's automobiles that are pretty much all the same, look the same, these are the ones that have the artistic glamour. There just wasn't anything like it then, and there's very little like it today. We like to think of this place as a time machine. It just takes you back to a different era. The building itself, the contents, and what you see reminds us all of what made this country great and what was accomplished all those 75, 80 years ago or more in the way of industry. You know, Daryl, it was fascinating to see all the time and effort that went into restoring those cars. And it makes sense. Fort Wayne has a reputation for preservation. Yeah, just like the historic embassy theater behind us. But not only does Fort Wayne have a reputation for preserving history, they also have a reputation for discovering history as well. Many people have heard about the Salt Lake Family History Library, but few realize that the largest public genealogical research facility in the country is right here in Indiana. And it all started with an eccentric library director named Fred Reynolds. He would actually, on the weekends, take a library station wagon and drive around the whole Midwest area, 
who's doing something that 20th century librarians didn't do in the 40s and 50s, and that was buy used books. But in the process, he collected a tremendous amount of local history, heraldry, and family history. So in 1961, he started the department. It just took off like a bonfire. And from a collection of a few hundred volumes to now north of a million volumes, it was literally the catalyst that started this collection. People ask us, so why do people keep coming to the Genealogy Center when there's a lot of things online, there's a great family history library, and I tell them quite sincerely, and I believe it, people come here for the experience. It quickly becomes somewhat of a sickness where you just find yourself needing and wanting more because there's never an end to it. So every question answered just brought 10 more questions. It's that very experience that initially attracted Rex Bertram to the library nearly 20 years ago. He found himself driving four hours round trip, sun up to sun down, looking for the next answer in his growing family tree. The allure of that challenge led Rex to becoming a professional genealogist, specializing in cases where normal research has led to dead ends. I like the real analytical type of work where I'm really having to think outside the box. I'm having to think of new ways to search and to piece together clues. I've always said that the internet is the best thing that ever happened to genealogy and the worst thing that ever happened to genealogy. So many people post their trees online without any kind of documentation, without anything to support anything they've got. And then what happens is someone else gets it from them, from them, and it spreads like a fire. And this is all oftentimes incorrect information that's being passed around from place to place to place. Which is why the Allen County Public Library is a perfect hunting ground for this historical detective. The center features the largest periodical collection in the world, as well as over 350,000 printed volumes, including church, court, and census records, and over 70,000 compiled family histories. When people say, what do you collect? The shortest answer is usually, yes, whatever you can pick, and quite literally, little church publications, published county histories, city directories, town directories, high school yearbooks, college yearbooks, scrapbooks. We collect it all because it's setting a context for the community. A lot of libraries will only want published materials. And we've always said, it's all about family history, it's all about data. We can help organize the archival data and make it into something that public library customers can use. So we've really been outliers, and it's really served us well. We have people literally from all over sending us materials. Um, sometimes we feel like we're drinking from a fire hose. There's so much coming in, but step by step, day by day, we continue to catalog more items. So each month we add several thousand records to our website and we add at least a thousand physical items, be they microfilm or books. And so researchers who were here 18 months ago, there's at least 18,000 to 20,000 new items in the collection today that weren't there when they visit us last. That's the challenge of it, but that's also the excitement. It's keeping our web of connectivity alive. There have been an increasing number of studies saying, you know, kids who know something, anything, even a little bit about their family history, are more focused in school, they pay better attention. I think the whole thing of, you know, feeling connected, feeling like you've been lived for, you've been bled for, you've been cried for, you've been died for, you know, connecting people to their past, that's a powerful thing for any individual, particularly a young person to know that you're not just a nobody, you are somebody, uh, and having the context to that. People come from all over the world to visit the Genealogy Center, and while they're there, if they show up here to the Follinger Fryman Botanical Conservatory, they're certain to find some plants that they're familiar with as well. And Andy, uh, could you tell us a little bit about this beautiful facility? Uh, the Follinger Fryman Conservatory is a uh, 25,000 square foot indoor gardens. We have three main gardens. One is a showcase garden where we feature seasonal displays of flowers. Then we have uh, the tropical garden full of green lush foliage. And then we also have a desert garden where the main focus in there is the Sonoran Desert. Could you explain a little bit about why this conservatory is in Fort Wayne? Um, this was kind of the uh, dream of two uh, local people, Frank Fryman and Helene Fullinger. Some local business people back in the early 80s dreamt this up, donated the money to get it going. 
that's how it got started and it's helped keep us going. Now Andy, you've been here for 24 years. Yes. And could you tell us some of the special pieces that you, you're really proud of? The orchids that we feature are, I think, interesting. They're not always in bloom, but some of them have really interesting flowers. And then I think having worked with the plants in our desert garden for the last 24 years, I've developed a big interest for those as well. One of the funnest things we did though was a couple of years ago in the fall, we added saguaro cactus to our desert garden and uh, the cactus were 23 feet tall, so the big ones from the Sonoran Desert with the, the arms that go out. And uh, we had to take, it, take glass out of the roof and lower them in from above to get them in. One of the aspects of the Botanical Conservatory that really stands out for me is that this is a plant rescue center as well. Oh yeah, we have been since I think it was 1991. Uh, we're a CITES plant rescue center. That's uh, when plants come into the country illegally for whatever reason, they will confiscate them if they are plants that are threatened or endangered or protected somehow. And they have about 150 facilities around the country that they will call and try and find that plant a home. And we are one of those facilities. Andy, it's so exciting to be able to see the home that you've been able to provide such a variety of plants. So thank you for spending some time with us today. You're welcome. Well, the challenge that Andy faces in keeping this facility so warm and, and comfortable for these plants, our next story highlights a different challenge in trying to keep the temperature quite cold. Curling first came to the city of Fort Wayne back in the 1880s when John Bass built the Bass Mansion. And when he did that, he brought a number of Scottish craftsmen. And those people stayed and brought their traditional sport of curling to the city of Fort Wayne at that time. And after the 2010 Olympics, we found that they had built a new ice rink in town. We approached them about doing curling, and they were uh, very interested. So we got the club started up in 2010. Four years later, just before the uh, 2014 Winter Olympics, we built this new facility. So right now, we're the only dedicated curling facility in the state of Indiana. The closest dedicated clubs like ours are in Chicago, Columbus, and Detroit. But there are arena clubs in Kalamazoo, Lansing, Indianapolis, lots of other places. So there's plenty of clubs in an easy drive, but a very few that have a dedicated facility like this with the ice quality and the social aspect of the game, which really gets people excited. Now, arena club ice compared to this, this is so much better than what we were at. We don't have to try to figure out, okay, there was a hockey game before us, did the Zamboni scrape and flood the ice correctly beforehand. We know what the ice is like, and it makes the games actually a lot more competitive because there's no guess if the ice is gonna actually affect a shot. It's gonna be, can you execute the shot? Are you able to do it? And it actually makes it a lot more competitive and more fun. I didn't realize there was as much strategy involved as there was. It actually is like chess on ice. The beginning of the game, the end of the game. It's a great community sport. You can meet a lot of cool people. I think it's just one of those things that it adds another step to Fort Wayne to help you know, build up Fort Wayne. Most common reaction is curling. We have curling here in Fort Wayne, that thing on the Olympics. But other than that, it's, uh, you know, I didn't know you existed. I've always wanted to do that. That looks so interesting. We, like most other curling clubs, run what are called learn to curl sessions. It's an opportunity for people that have never done the sport before to come out and, and get a gentle introduction to the sport. We've established some rookie leagues, which is a chance for people who've just done a learn to curl to play in a, in a short league against other people of, of similar ability. And that's really where we get the hooks in people. When they get to start playing games, they make their first shot. That's when people really, you see their, their faces light up and they get really excited and they want to come back. I think our youngest curler is now 12 years old. He's been curling for two years, so we started at 10. And our oldest curler just turned 80. You know, it's really a sport that anyone can participate in. And one of the things I like best about the sport is it's one of the only sports that I can think of where three generations of the same family can play on the same team and be competitive. And not many other sports you can, you can think of that, that have that sort of opportunity for families to curl together or play together. Curling is a sport that's really rooted in sportsmanship. If you watch the Olympics, you never saw an official out on the ice. The players call their own fouls, the players figure out the score themselves. It just seems to attract you know, really nice people, people that are fun to hang around with and socialize with. And a lot of our curlers like that even more than the curling aspect of things because it, it really is a community. A big part of the game is what we call broom stacking, which is when the teams uh, sit down together after the game. And the tradition is that the winning team buys the first round of drinks for the losing team. I think a lot of sports, the two teams either don't like each other or at least have to act like they don't like each other. You don't get that in curling. The biggest challenge in, in building the club was it's not something that a lot of Americans know a whole lot about. You know, luckily the Olympics have helped with that, raising the exposure of the sport. We want to do things that attract people to the city. We've run Fort Wayne Summer Spiel for four years. Last year we had partnered with the United States Curling Association and we brought in the Olympic team from China, 
the Olympic team from Great Britain, and all four teams that were eligible to become the U.S. women's Olympic team. We had the highest level of competition in any women's curling tournament ever in the United States. So we're pretty excited about that and, and the level of support we've gotten from the curling community countrywide as well as the United States Curling Association. There's not many cities, you know, of our size that have something like this. So, you know, we like being a part of that, something that citizens can hang their hat on and say, hey, Fort Wayne has this and other cities in the state don't. So uh, we find that to be exciting and, and fulfilling for us. Wow, I had no idea that there was such dedication to curling here in Fort Wayne. I love it. <laughs> well, that's all the time that we've got for tonight, but I have to say this is one of my favorite episodes, if for no other reason than I got to have my first Coney dog. You know, I grew up in this area and I had no idea about the genealogy center and my ability to check out my family tree. So you got to come up to Fort Wayne and check it out. Absolutely. Thanks so much for joining us in Fort Wayne tonight. Good, Good night. night. Production support for the weekly special is provided by Smithville, a local provider of fiber optic based internet, TV, and phone services. Smithville's quantum fiber optic network allows large amounts of data to travel around the world from local homes and businesses. More at smithville.net. IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. publichealth.indiana.edu. And WTIU members, thank you.